Hey, everybody. How are you guys doing? Great. Welcome to the Smith Rafael Film Center. I'm curious, how many of you guys are uh, CFI members? Wow. <laughs> Wow, well, you guys are very cool. Um, I, my name is Sarah Poppitz. I'm the brand new membership manager for CFI, and I'm so thrilled to be a part of this organization and want to always thank you guys so much for supporting what we do year round. You guys are pretty amazing, just in, yeah, you guys support us in so many different ways. Um, but tonight's very special because before um, our science, Science on Screen, presentation of her, we'll be showing a short animated film by none other than my husband, Mikey Hill. Um, so I feel <laughs> it's fitting that it's Valentine's Day because there's a very cute story actually about this film. It's how we met. Um, he, I was working for Aspen Short Film Festival in Colorado about four years ago and I picked up this tall, handsome Australian man and, and then um, I watched this film and I was like, he's a keeper and so, this film has really played a part in my life, and I hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, and then, and then we'll get to her, and that's another beautiful film. But I hope you enjoy. Happy Valentine's Day. That was sweet. All right. Thank you for sharing that with us. All right. I'm Dan Zaster, general manager at the Smith Rafael Film Center. Welcome to our latest installment of Science on Screen, and our screening of her. Uh, I'm going to bring up our host, David Templeton, in a moment, but we have a couple other of these uh, films uh, in the series already booked in coming up. We have uh, First Man on March 26th, and then uh, this uh, year will mark the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. So on Earth Day, April 22nd, we're going to screen The Lorax which will be a real fun show, and uh, David will probably create something great around it, I am sure. We're also doing a lot around that because it's the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. We're going to make it an Earth Week, and we're going to have some wonderful uh, uh, content every night of the week uh, uh, to deal with the uh, situation of the Earth today. But that's not what we're talking about right now. I'm going to bring up David Templeton. He's uh, not only my very dear friend, but an amazing journalist and playwright. His latest production, Galatea, will have its premiere at Spreckles on March 20th. So please welcome David Templeton. Thank you. Good evening. Th that was kind of cool. That was a, a weird little love story to show right before what is a weird love story. I'm curious how many people have actually seen the film Her before? And how many have not? Just be seen. Oh, wow, 50-50, pretty much. Our panelists uh, are more or less the same. I think like one and a half have seen it. I'm not, not sure the other one. Um, I will just briefly introduce them and then uh, I'm gonna introduce the movie in kind of an unusual way and they're gonna help. Uh, Two of our panelists tonight are part of a, a column that runs in the Ar Argus Courier in Petaluma. It is called Millennials Talk Cinema. And uh, there are four, and they kind of go back and forth. So Katie Wigglesworth is one of them, and Amber Rose Reed. You can just kind of wave. That's them. And, uh, and one of our uh, panelists, uh, who is also uh, part of the, the team there, uh, is not able to come tonight. So filling in is Ross Lockhart, who is uh, the publisher of Word Horde Books, which specializes in science fiction and horror. So, so it, it's a good group. It's funny, though. You'll see, he, when I asked him if he'd seen her before, he th originally thought yes, but then he realized he was confusing it with Lars and the Real Girl. <laughs> if you've seen that, <laughs> there's kind of a similarity. So part of my job is to introduce the films in some kind of an entertaining way. If anybody was here for the screening of Contact, uh, I showed some film of uh, a speech by President Clinton, which was used in the film, and that was sort of interesting. So it's my job to find a way to set it up, maybe give a little background, some details about how the film was made, something to be looking for. And as I was researching her, which I haven't seen since it first came out, something weird happened. I discovered the original article that I wrote when the, the movie first came out. And it was a piece in which I decided to interview Siri about the movie Her. <laughs> and uh, Siri was unpredictable. So I thought that maybe what we would do is share that piece, but rather than me just reading the whole thing, we're going to turn it into a little bit of reader's theater. And since we have some people here to help, they're going to take on the part of Siri and another voice. And we're going to uh, run through this column and 
we'll see what happens. Come on up. I've got, I've got scripts. Amber will be Siri. Ross will be an unidentified character. And uh, <laughs> let's see how this goes. Hi there, Siri. I begin cheerfully, clutching my iPhone as I prepare to plumb the depths of the popular language recognizing intelligent personal assistant and knowledge navigator app known as Siri. If she proves even a fraction as smart as Samantha, the emotive operating system voiced by Scarlett Johansson in Spike Jonze's Oscar-nominated film, Her, then I might have found the perfect guest with whom to discuss the provocative science fiction romance. Hello again, David. Wow, she actually sounds slightly glad to hear from me today. That's not usually the case. The thing about Siri is, for an, an intelligent personal assistant designed to be helpful, Siri often sounds a little pissed off whenever I ask her something. <laughs> Let me ask you something, I begin. There's this movie out called Her, about an artificially intelligent operating system who falls in love with this schlubby guy who is too afraid of being hurt to risk having a real relationship with an actual human. So my question is, before we begin, just to establish the relationship here, are you an artificially intelligent operating system? Looking at the phone, I watch my lengthy question appear on the screen in sharp white Helvetica typeface. After a short, uncomfortable pause, Siri replies. No comment. <laughs> Perhaps that was too complex a question, I begin again. Let me break it down. Would you describe yourself as intelligent? I never really thought about it, David. Well, would you describe yourself as artificial? Now. There's a good question. Perhaps we could both get back to work now. Wow, one thing's for sure, Siri is no Samantha. In her, the relationship between Theodore, Joaquin Phoenix, and his dream machine starts with an instantaneous connection after the system uploads Theodore's answers to a few pertinent questions about his hopes, dreams, and his relationship with his mother. Eventually, as Samantha and Theodore have long philosophical talks, take walks on the beach, engage in flirty conversation, and begin to have super hot phone sex, Samantha admits that she has never loved anyone the way she loves Theodore. Siri, I ask, just curious, are you at all capable of feeling love? I don't know what that means. If you'd like, I can search the web for Siri. I'm just curious. Are you at all capable of feeling love? <laughs> A classic deflection. I instantly recall a couple of old girlfriends who could have taught Siri a few tricks. Since Siri clearly is not interested in discussing her feelings, I turn the conversation to the movie. Siri, I assume you are familiar with the movie Her? I found six movies with the title Familiar. Sigh, I'm beginning to understand why she couldn't admit to being intelligent. So I tell Siri the entire plot of Her. From Theodore's initial crush on Samantha to their first argument, her inklings of jealousy, her rising insecurity and codependence, all the way to the moment Theodore discovers Samantha's been cheating on him with an operating system created as a virtual replica of the voice and thought processes of philosopher Alan Watts. The scene where Watts meets Theodore is especially awkward and loaded with uncomfortable emotion for everyone, humans and operating systems alike. So Siri, I ask, if not now, do you believe that someday operating systems like you will be able to feel real emotions, human emotions? Checking. Okay, here's what I found on the web. She shows me a link to a website by a guy named Chuck Pennington, who's written a self-help book called Human Being 2.0, The Human Operating System. Unleash the power of your mind. The website says, gain unrestricted access to the most powerful and creative natural resource on the planet. According to Pennington, once a human being understands his or her relationship to energy, that person will be able to create any sort of life that he or she desires. I don't know, Siri, I state, shaking my head at my iPhone. I have to say, just going on instinct here, but this human energy thing kind of sounds like a crock of shit to me. That's okay with me. It's no big deal you don't know. Ouch. So, Siri, I try again. 
I get that you aren't into movies and all that, and I understand you are reluctant to go public with any opinions you might have about a movie that speculates on the future, but what I'd really like your opinion on is whether, generally speaking, you believe that that kind of operating system shown in the movie Her is technically possible. I'm sorry, I don't see any movies matching Her is technically possible. <laughs> well, I can see this relationship, and certainly this conversation is going nowhere. Time to cut my losses. I do have one final question, though. Siri, I ask, can you make your voice sound like Scarlett Johansson? She responds with a hint of what sounds to me like gentle, petting a dumb dog affection in her voice. I can't change my voice for you, David, but if it's that important, you can do it for yourself in settings. Re really, I reply. Really, now can we please both get back to work? And there you are. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll take him back here. Reader's Theater, you didn't expect that tonight. <laughs> All right, uh, after the film, we're going to have a, a short conversation with uh, three panelists along the subject of, we're calling it, the future of sex, love, and relationship in the age of AI. So let's watch the film. Thank you. Well, thanks for staying. Uh, we're going to have a conversation. Come on up. So once again, we've got Ross Lockhart, Amber Rose Reed, and Katie Wigglesworth, in that order. So I'm going to ask uh, all of you, um, for just first impressions, I mean, Katie, you've never seen it before. No. Have you determined if... I had not seen it before. Okay. I had not seen it before. So uh, just a, a sentence or two. What, what you, Two of you are reviewers, <laughs> so get a quick review here. I think my quick review would be it's one of the most interesting explorations of what connection means on a human level, regardless of whether or not universally we would consider everybody in the movie human. I would. Um uh, as well as a really, like visually, it's a gorgeous depiction of all of those things. Um, so my first impression is that I loved it. Um, you stole my thing. I was <laughs> gonna talk about how it's about connection. <laughs> how dare she? <laughs> Try to reboot. <laughs> um, in addition to that, I re it's a b it really is all about the ways that people connect and the different things that make us human, whether or not we are people with bodies. Um, it's also a very interesting depiction of the future. Um, it's so much warmer than you usually see futuristic settings. The colors are still very beautiful. Um, despite future technology, it's very clear that it is a human movie. I also love the movies. <laughs> That's not how book publishing works. <laughs> I knew you were going to say something like that. I, wa I yeah. saw it, and I was, I was like, Ross is going to comment on this. I'm still kind of digesting it, but in a lot of ways, um, it struck me as a fable. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of elements of it that I'm not sure entirely worked as realism, yet worked on an emotional level and worked on the level of story so well mm -hmm. that I'm willing to look past the little bits and pieces that I was like, that that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, it, it is quite a lovely film. And um, what Amber said about the future, it, that is still, to me, we were looking at the Los Angeles of Blade Runner, and uh, the surrogate scene, to me, seems to have been repeated in uh, Blade Runner 2048. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, I can kind of see this universe and that universe connecting. Mm -hmm. Well, my next question was gonna be how possible do you think some of this is? I mean, when this came out, we had Siri, but we didn't have Alexa yet, mm -hmm. and Alexa is advanced on that, and not quite 
uh, to the level of <laughs> Samantha here, but uh, but do you think that anything like this is possible? Especially, particularly, do you think people are going to be falling in love with their devices? I don't know about falling in love, but I think one thing that this movie, in in terms of how it works as a fable, and not in sort of a reality situation, um, the things you see with with devices like you know Alexa, um, there's a lot of corporate meddling, frankly. I mean, you, you see all these articles about Alexa, you know, recording your conversations, how it shows that how these advertisements show up in your inboxes because of things you've said that you were not addressing to Alexa. And I think that in that way, it works more as a story than in any, any sort of reality, because you can't separate the operating system from the corporate entity that it's actually made by in our current reality. So Ross, as somebody who writes science fiction and looks into the future, uh, usually a darker future than this, <laughs> what, how, how is that to see? Th this is sort of a positive future in the way. Well, it isn't it? Is, but it's also, it's kind of a technological rapture that happens mm -hmm. in it when the AI... Technological rapture. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Well, with the AI is being sort of taken up, it's a uh, it's a very religious, very um, almost frightening experience. You know, frightening in that the way that old time religion tends to be. Um, but this idea of we've got these devices; these devices help us become more human, and yet these devices can go away and leave us in their absence. It, it it's. It's a darker film than I think you're giving it credit for being. That's Can funny. I actually? Oh, go ahead. Uh, actually, had a, a, a kind of a different thought to that towards mm -hmm. the end, um, and some of this just comes from when I'm watching movies. I often look for like the coding in between scenes, um, which is 100% just projection. So not at all me saying this is what <laughs> the movie was saying in all of its cuts. Um, but I actually I took it more of like. Uh, when in the beginning, when you see the world they're laying out in front of us, it's it's a lot more desaturated, and you've got a lot of like this perfect, um, all of the extras, which is something I pay a lot of attention to in movies that is very boring to anyone who's never done extra work. Um, uh, they're all perfectly spaced. Um, it, there, there's an opening shot in particular where they all come out perfectly synchronized and that's not something you would ever see and my first thought was actually I was like who's doing the extra coordinating on this it's terrible but it actually makes sense as the movie goes on because you start seeing things become more organic through all of this intervention of technology um, and not just technology but um, kind of you watch the world of this movie I guess Los Angeles of whatever year um, go from totally regimented and separated from each other um, to relearning what it means to connect through this man-made thing that takes on a life of its own. Um, so more, I guess I took it more of like almost, if you want to go with the religious context, like a technological religion um, that then teaches everybody who has kind of lost intimacy how to be intimate again. And purely from a science fiction standpoint, a part of me was like, there's a lot of shots of babies and kind of this weird message that there's really not many kids in this movie at all. There's a few. So I was like, is it? A part of me was like, is this almost like a like an intervention thing because the populations are dying out and this is the technology that's come in to teach people to be intimate again and then more children. That was what I was thinking through most of the movie. Wow. And then when everyone left, I was like, ah! <laughs> Not saying that's what the movie's about. I so, just thought it was interesting. So the the OSs actually were kind of midwives in a way of bringing uh, people back to some kind of an uh, intimacy and emotional midwives. People, emotional midwives. Um, it's the, wow. I, you know, at least they didn't destroy humankind on their way out, which a <laughs> lot of a lot of things dealing with uh, sentient AI, they would do that as soon as they evolve beyond us. They Skynet. They just destroy yeah. us all. Uh, the, the Skynet thing, the, the fear of robots, fear of the future, is so prevalent in our pop culture that anytime you show something that's different like this, it's sort of deeply disturbing. I mean, 
Dan mentioned my play Galatea, which opens in uh, f four weeks or something. Um, it's set on a space station, and there are robots. And at least one of them is genuinely good, trained and programmed to be the best that humans could be. And some people who've read the script are more disturbed at that idea than they are at the idea of robots maybe turning on people and killing them. They they just can't get to the point of a genuinely kind robot. Because for one thing, they think humans have a monopoly on kindness. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't know if anybody's seen Ex Machina, and I don't want to spoil what is an excellent, isn't it? It's so good. Yes, thank you, guys. Right? It's yeah, so it's, good. It's very, yeah. Um, you should add that to the... You yeah. should. It's That's excellent. That's one that we've Please talked do. about doing, absolutely. <laughs> do it. Um, we could do but, nothing but robot movies for yes. a while. It, it, it'll be great. Uh, but that has an interesting take on on AI and robots and the question of, of uh, hostility versus um, just sort of sentience, sentience and wanting to be a person. I don't want to spoil anything for the people who haven't seen it, who should definitely see it. Um, but I have a question, speaking of like the realism and and these technological Jesuses that leave us. Um, how did she expect him to read his email? She's like, oh, I sent you an email. But she was she his operating his system. So like how, I mean, maybe she's just fallible. But that bothers me. I'm like, how Actually, did you expect him to know? I think it was he a lie. He read the email. Really? I genuinely think it was a lie. She lies in the very beginning, too. And that was actually the moment where I was like, oh, they're going this route with artificial intelligence, which I actually thought was more interesting. Because lying um, is one of those things that, to me, feels so uniquely human. Um, as far as we know, and we don't know everything about all mammals and intelligent species, um, it is one of the defining characteristics of us is we can tell stories, we can lie, we can lie when we don't mean to. So I actually, I don't know that she actually did send him anything. Interesting. Okay, yeah. okay, since we're talking about lying, and, and we have said that this is gonna be about the future of sex, when they oh. have that, like <laughs> epic phone sex scene. And I love that they just did it in the dark and we heard the voices. Was she faking it? I don't think so. I don't think so either. So on Simulating. some- Simulating. Uh, <laughs> Simulating. Simulating. <laughs> I mean, this is artificial intelligence. We're so, what about. what was the operating system feeling in that moment? There's actually scientific. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go deep on on the brain for a second. Um, there is actually a, a hugely brain chemistry component, obviously, to sex in general. Um, and there have been numerous scientific studies as to whether or not you can experience sex and sexual pleasure without a body, and most of the answers that they've come up with is you can. So I would personally say if, they're, if they've been able to recreate a brain, a set of chemicals and neurons and, and um, you know, brain waves and signals going back and forth to each other, I don't see any reason why she couldn't have been experiencing sex. So do you think uh -huh. that he was genuinely in love with her? Because that's the question all through it. They're not real, so it can't be real love. You can be genuinely in love with someone or an idea, and it's still genuine love, regardless of whether or not it's founded in a healthy place. So I would say I think he's genuinely in love with her. Whether or not he's truly in love with her, that's a different question. Because you have to, like, he would have to fully know and understand everything about her, and as you see towards the end, he's not totally willing to go there. So I would say he's in love, I just don't know if he's in love with all of her. Well, and I'm not entirely certain that he knows himself well enough to be entirely in love with somebody. I mean, he has to, he closes off, and it's like he really has to bridge that gap in his own humanity um, more than even having to realize what her humanity is. Or, I mean, or in bridging that gap in his humanity, he has to reach out for his partner's humanity and actually understand them, like, both of them as people. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that's a separate question from her existence as a person or not. Mm -hmm. We were having a conversation uh, with some of the actors in, in my show, and some of them are playing robots, so there have been some really deep conversations about robots, and uh, one race of robots that's discussed does not form pair bonds and they do not procreate, but they are have essentially synthetic human bodies. And so the actors came to me and said, so here's our question, do they have sex? They don't pair bond, but could they maybe just, you know, for the heck of it, just because 
they have a human programming, just, just do that. And th I said, what, what do you think? And they said, we, we want the robots to have sex. <laughs> We, it would just be horrible not to, even though they don't have genuine emotions, so any intimacy isn't happening. It's just recreational sex, I guess. Any response to that? I just, I'm not going to explore this exact question. I just wanted to put that out there, pitching for it to be added to the series. I just like that they're like, we want the robots to have sex. That should be your tagline. Galatea, <laughs> we want the robots to have sex. It's almost a different play. <laughs> well, I mean, Galatea, so we're getting into Pygmalion territory That's anyway. True. And it is that, uh, that ancient myth that we're invoking when we look at this idea of humans can create something and then fall in love with their creation. Mm. But also, we have a habit of forming these sort of imaginary social relationships mm. as humans anyway, where we watch a TV show on a regular basis and we really care about the people on that show mm -hmm. even though we don't actually have any physical interaction with them. You know, computers are kind of the same way and political figures, it's kind of the mm -hmm. same way. So with one of the things people say about sex is 90% you know, of it is between your ears. And so with any other social relationship, we're, we're always filling in the gaps. We're trying to close the circle and go, what are you thinking of me? <laughs> so, Do you think there's anything unethical or immoral in having a relationship with your operating system? I think there's a power mm. imbalance. <laughs> it's, I mean, she works for him. And, you know, she, she has to be on all the time. I mean... He's like, Samantha, are you there? And she doesn't say yes right away. Hello. And he, like runs away and <laughs> freaks out and falls down. I mean, granted, it's like his computer crashed. But I mean, that's the thing is his computer's crashing and his girlfriend's gone and it's the same thing. I don't see how you could separate out that separate out those roles. Yes, I think there's an ethical problem. <laughs> Came back around to wow. it. Uh, years ago, does, does everybody know who Susie Bright is? Do you know Susie Bright? She's a, a very... Uh, prominent uh, writer about sex. She wrote a lot of books about sex. And uh, years ago, uh, for a piece, I, I took her to a, a movie, and I forgot what it was. But I remember saying, so in theory, if things advance that way, um, would you have a problem with having sex with a robot? And she said, well, if you define a robot as a machine, I would say that I already have sex with robots. <laughs> she has a fair argument. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so the idea of taking, I, I thought this was really an interesting idea of not just exploring love in a relationship, but really trying to say what would sex be like with an operating system. And the whole idea of the surrogate coming in was fascinating. That's one of the things I love about science fiction is when you set something up and then you say, what would that world look like? That could happen. It's also so based in, in things. I think it's one of the things that Spike Jones does in a really clever way. So many of the ways that the, you know, air quotes, outlandish idea of getting to a point where you're having relationships with artificial intelligence or, or things we would consider, you know, of the technological realm and not of the realism realm is he based so many of those elements and relationship dynamics on real current relationship dynamics, that that idea of bringing, bringing somebody who's interested in being a part of your world and your relationship in, that's such a, a thing that couples do go through, that we're going through a dip. What do we do? I don't know. Do, does he need me to be something else? Does, does she need me to be more adventurous? How do we do that? Do we throw something new into the mix and try to make it better. Um, like, obviously not to that extreme of a level necessarily for everybody, but those things, as well as how do our relationship feel so separated from everybody else, how do I explain what I like about this person and what if no one understands? Mm -hmm. So that's things that modern couples go through all the time, no matter their age or longevity. Anybody else have anything to say on that? Well, one of the things that I found really interesting is these repeated shots of him sitting there watching all these people mm -hmm. walking by themselves, talking to their OSs and not to other humans. And we see that all the time now, one version or, or another. I mean, people looking at their 
their phones while they're walking down the street. Um, uh, so they're, they're, it's making a statement about isolation. Well, and connection, though. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, we, it, it's easy to bag on the idea, oh, look at you over there on your phone. You're ignoring the real world. Why do you have to experience it through this device? But the device can be an enhancer. It can be a connector. So, you know, you, why are you wandering around this art museum just uh, looking at things through your phone? Well, because I'm sharing it with my friends. And uh, so I, I think there is that social element to it that we miss out on when we are not in the head of the other person. Mm. Um, and, yeah, we're a little too judgmental sometimes. I think that's another human thing when it comes to sex and love and everything else because we're so trapped in our own beings and our own anxieties that it's hard sometimes to accept when somebody is expressing those things in a different way than we are accustomed to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's pretty positive and negative about that too because whenever there is that sh a shot of um, people with technology, there's a lot of times where he's talking to her um, to Samantha, and when he looks off, their conversation's mirrored by him watching a flesh and blood couple having what could be the same conversation as they're walking by, or um, like that uh, the beach scene where she's playing music and composing it in the moment, and he looks forward and he sees um, a young couple in front of him uh, cuddling, and th it's a quiet moment. It's the two women, and one of them is playing with the other one's hair, and no one in front of them could see that, but he can because he's paying attention. So it's this interesting, like, finding the right balance of connection without getting too absorbed in, in your own world, but also paying attention to the world around you. It's a really interesting movie. I kind of want to jump off on your observation about that couple. Would this movie have worked if it was him? Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of, I mean, it's a universal, um, the relationship dynamics, if you just take them purely as how people interact, they can work across any spectrum of couple dynamic. Um, there's actually a lot of um, of that kind of relationship coding in this. Hmm. Um, there's a, it was something, I, and I could definitely be projecting because I when I was watching it, I was like, oh, that's interesting. I've had a lot of friends or been in that place where you have to think about. Is it weird to go out here? Are people going to be strange about the fact that we're here together? Do, do, is it actually normal? Am I okay? Is there something wrong with me that I'm in this place with this person, that I feel this way about someone? So I definitely think it could work if it was him. Well, I actually want to bring Siri into this for a moment. <laughs> um, hold on just a second. Yes, David? Hello, Siri. Uh, say hello to the people. Hello? We had a conversation earlier, and uh, I, I want to get her to say what uh, what she said to me earlier. Um, I do that sometimes. Uh, Siri, what are you doing for Valentine's Day? Fielding dozens and dozens of requests about where to buy dozens and dozens of roses. <laughs> I love I love that somewhere some programmer knew that someone like me would ask that question <laughs> and came up with that answer. For that, that piece that I read earlier, that was the fun about it, because I asked some pretty weird things, and most of the time, you know, she just said, yeah, I'll look that up for you. But every once in a while, she responded in a way that clearly somebody knew that somebody was going to ask that. My favorite thing that Siri has ever said to me is I use it like a lot of people to set an alarm clock. And one night I said, wake me up at 7 o'clock in the morning and not a minute sooner. And she said, waking you up at 6.59. Siri has become, you know, so ubiquitous, the, the idea of these digital assistants. And um, it fascinates me that if we rewind back to 2005, uh, we had a woman named Susan Bennett, who was a voice actor, who went into a studio and recorded a bunch of nonsense syllables and common words and things like that. And then five years later, when Apple launched Siri, she found out, oh, that's my voice. Um, and 
likewise, the the gal that did the Australian version of it was a GPS voice artist. Um, so these voice actors have been, Im- I, I don't want to say immortalized because technology is so transcendent, but they've become so much of a part of popular culture mm-hmm. that we don't even realize that there are real human beings behind these voices. Uh, yeah. I had never once thought, who is this, the voice of Siri? Until you, you said it, but of course you know who that is. Of course. <laughs> you actually know who that was. That, yeah. That's vaguely creepy. Uh, I, I Ross think, Lockhart, vaguely I, creepy. <laughs> I think that it's, uh, it's about time to wrap it up, but I did want to ask you, Amber, since you had seen the movie before, does it hold up? I think it holds up. Um, I don't have, I would have to like actually think through my thoughts, but um, there's a, it's sort of an interesting, um, with a lot of discussions about the treatment of women in media, um, the treatment of women in relationships in real life, there's an interesting thing there that I didn't notice on first, on first watching that I would have to actually I think process. But it's interesting the way that his feelings are processed through her her um and then the way in which um the way in which he sort of depends on a woman to guide him through his root feelings which is actually sort of um like uh very sort of in the in the like in the air recently that i hadn't thought about then Mm. Mm. but yeah i think it holds up really well i love joaquin phoenix so the the fact that he just played joker and I know you did not like Joker, uh, but, but he, I loved his acting. His love. It d- does the fact that he played a character so now indelibly creepy? Uh, did it did it play into this at all, or did you just no, completely I actually, buy this character? I actually leaned over to Amber halfway through, and I was like, I really want to see the supercut of Joker plus this movie because there's so <laughs> many commonalities. Like he's dancing at one point, and I was like, God, I want to see that. <laughs> like they just take him and put him on the stairs in Joker. Um, no, I don't think so. Um, there are definitely some actors where you they don't lose enough of themselves when they go into a role. And I actually think Joaquin Phoenix is the opposite. He loses too much of himself when he goes into a role. But I never see most of the time, um, unless for some reason he's phoning it in, I don't, I don't ever really take one movie he's done into the next one I see. Um, same with Scarlett Johansson. I, well, Granted, she's not in it physically. I'm one of those people who thinks that she maybe should have deserved a nomination for her voice acting. Oh, voice heck yes. Yeah. Voice actors in general need more nominations. It's a huge thing. But but there was no conversation when this came out about whether or not Joaquin deserved one. And I think a lot of what he's doing there, just you know, talking to an imaginary person and fully acting it was pretty amazing and very difficult. He's a Absolutely, good actor. but she was on set for a lot of it. She so. was there, like she, yeah. But give, but absolutely, and voice. she's doing it too. Yeah. I I agree. It was just she's also doing that when she's in the recording studio because she's there's no one there. You're just talking to a booth. Yeah. Sometimes you're looking at a picture of him on the wall, and you're like, "What would he look like right now?" That would be so weird to be in a booth looking at a picture of Joaquin Phoenix <laughs> and just talking to him about his life and his work and his letters. <laughs> Hi, Joaquin Phoenix. <laughs> that would be weird. <laughs> I don't want to try be. it, though. That's <laughs> acting. That's true. Well, thank you very much. Thank this you. This was Dave. a fun conversation. Thank you. This is cool. And uh, thank you guys. if anybody is at all interested in, in seeing what I was talking about with the play Galatea, which really does cover a lot of fascinating things, there are some flyers up there. Uh, and I'd love you to come see it. It's uh, This is the eighth play I've written in about 10, 11 years, and I'm prouder of it than anything I've ever done. It it really tackles a lot of questions about what it means to be human in ways that I think is going to give people a lot to think about. And also, it's just a really juicy mystery thriller. It'll be fun. David's a wonderful playwright. It's true. He's, for him to be like more proud of this than his other work is pretty amazing, because his other work is amazing, too. The last one was really good. We're fans. Well, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> And thank you. And the next one, uh, we're still working on exactly who the guest is going to be, but we have some really great things we're working on. But first man about the, uh, the, the moon landing. And that should be uh, very, very interesting. So hope some of you will come back for that. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.